how we talked about the sum and difference identities for cosine. Today, we'll go over the sum and difference identities for sine and tangent. Uh, we'll talk about what they are, how we get to them, we'll derive them, but we're going to derive them using the ones for cosine. So it'll be a little bit simpler than the way that we did it uh, last time. And then we'll apply them in a couple of problems, we'll verify an identity using those, and same sort of thing as before, just a couple of different uh, trig functions that we're working on. So, first thing that we'll look at, again, we're gonna use the cosine sum and difference identities to, uh, to actually derive the ones for sine and for tangent. So I know that I can write sine of a plus b using the co-function identity. I know sine of theta is the same as cosine of 90 degrees minus theta. So if I have sine of a plus b, then I can write that as cosine of 90 degrees minus just all of a plus b there, right? And then I can group these together. I would distribute the negative, so 90 degrees minus a minus b. And then I can regroup these so that I only have two angles that I'm dealing with. I can write that as cosine of 90 degrees minus a and then minus b. Right? And that gives me a, a first angle and a, and a second angle. If this was just cosine of a minus b, we have a difference identity that goes through that. All right? I know that cosine of a minus b is cosine a, cosine b, plus sine a, sine b. What we talked about last time, the one we derived, the one I said to make sure we understand that one, we're going to use it. So instead of a and b now, I'm just using 90 degrees minus a and then b. So I'm going to plug those into that, that difference formula. So I'm going to have cosine of 90 degrees minus a, cosine of b, and then plus sine of 90 degrees minus a, sine of b. Okay. And I can simplify that even further because I can use one of the identities, or really two of the identities, um, that I've already used. I talked about already using the co-function identity. What is cosine of 90 degrees minus a equivalent to? Yeah, it's just sine of a. And then sine of 90 degrees minus a is just cosine of a. So when I simplify this fully, I'm going to show that sine of a plus b is equal to sine of a cosine of b plus cosine of a sine of b. Right? Simplifying down to that, note the difference between that and the one for cosine. Right? First of all, cosine of you know, something minus something else has cosine of the first one, cosine of the second one. The, the cosines are grouped together, the sines are grouped together, and then that middle sign, the plus or minus, is opposite. Right? For sine of a plus b, it's sine of the first, cosine of the second, and then the sine of this is still the same one. It's plus up there, it's plus down here. And then cosine a, sine b, second. All right? Obviously, I don't have to go through all of that again if I want to know sine of a minus b. Because if I want sine of a minus b, just like we did with cosine when I was trying to find the other one, all I have to do is rewrite it with a negative angle, I can say that sine of a minus b is the same as sine of a plus negative b, and then just plug into exactly what we had for the sum identity. So I'm going to have sine of a cosine of negative b plus cosine of a sine of negative b. Right? Just plugging directly into that sum identity that we just found. And then I'm going to use those, the even odd identities, the negative function identities. Cosine is an even function, so cosine of negative b is the same as what? Yeah, just cosine of b. And sine of negative b, since sine is an odd function, is the same as negative sine of b. So I end up with sine of a, cosine of b on the left-hand side, same as we had before sine a, cosine b, but now I'm going to have a minus in between, and then cosine a, sine b. 
So a couple of differences between the sine and the cosine function sum and, I, and different identities. The sine in between here, whether it's plus or minus, stays the same. If it's sine of a minus b, I'm going to have a minus. If it's sine of a plus b, I'm going to have a plus. And then remember that I'm not going to group the sine terms together and cosine terms together. It's sine of the first one times cosine of the second one and minus cosine of the first one sine of the second one. All right? In that sum identity, this one right here, technically it doesn't matter which order you write them, I'm adding them together. I would still say probably remember it this way because this is supposed to be a minus here, obviously. In fact, I'm going to use this one. Uh, because when it is a subtraction, the order does matter. So make sure we're doing sine A cosine B first, and then cosine A sine B second. All right? If you do it for both of them, it's just the same way every time. All right? <coughs> Correct that if you have your notes somewhere. That's a minus, not a plus. All right? And then before using this, we'll get into also the sum and difference identities for tangent. But knowing what we already know, tangent of a plus b, I can write as what? Sine of a plus b over cosine of a plus b. Right? And I know what those identities are. I can rewrite sine of a plus b using this identity right here. Sine a cosine b plus cosine a sine b. I can rewrite cosine of a plus b as cosine a cosine b minus sine a sine b. So if I do that, I already have something that I can use. That's a lot of stuff. We're going to rewrite this in a way where since we started with tangent, we're only going to use the function tangent in the final answer. And that's why this next part's going to look a little weird. But it's because we're trying to simplify it in a particular way. This way right here will still always allow us to solve any problem where I'm looking for tangent of a plus b. If you just want to memorize these two and use those every time, that's okay. They'll still work. Right? If we want to simplify it a little bit, make it a little bit easier to work with, what we're going to do so that we can simplify things in a nice way is multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 1 over cosine of a cosine of b. All right? Numerator multiplied by this reciprocal, denominator multiplied by that same reciprocal. We'll see why that is when we multiply these into each term. All right? I'm going to multiply it to sine a cosine b, I'm going to multiply it to cosine a sine b, multiply it to cosine a, this b should be here on this side of the negative. So cosine a cosine b minus sine A, sine B there. All right? When we multiply those in, I can start looking at what's going to cancel out and what's going to simplify. So I end up with something like this. I have sine of A, cosine of B over cosine of A, cosine of B. Well, that means my cosine of B terms can cancel out. All right? I'm just going to be left with sine over cosine, both of A. And then I'm going to have cosine A sine B over cosine A cosine B. Well, the cosine of A terms cancel out. And I just have sine over cosine both of B in that case. All right? And this term on the denominator, cosine A cosine B over cosine A cosine B, all of that cancels. I'm just left with 1. And then minus sine of A cosine B over cosine A cosine B. Well, actually, this should be a sine, obviously. Sine A sine B over cosine A cosine B. It's, it is that way in the next step, but that should be a sign. So when I cancel everything out that needs to be canceled, sine of A over cosine of A plus sine of B over cosine of B, all divided by 1 minus sine of A over cosine of A times sine of B over cosine of B. All of those sine over cosines, again, because they're of the same angle, very important. If this was sine of A over cosine of B, then I can't do anything with that. But sine of B over cosine of B, I can write as tangent of B. Sine of A over cosine of A, I can write as tangent of A. Right? And we've simplified that down to 
tangent of a plus b is equal to tangent of a plus tangent of b over 1 minus tangent of a and times tangent of b. All right? This one has two different signs, so you're going to remember this one. Remember that the one in the numerator has the matching signs. Plus here, it was plus up here. And then it's the opposite sign in the denominator. All right? Obviously, I can do the same thing with this as we just did with sine. If I want to know tangent of a minus b, then I'm just going to do tangent of a plus negative b. All right? Tangent of negative b is going to be the same as negative tangent of b. So that will become tangent of a minus tangent b. This will be 1 plus tangent of a times tangent of b. It's an odd function there. All right? So I'm just going to do the same thing that we did a second ago. And knowing that tangent is an odd function, tangent of negative b becomes negative tangent of b. So what these are going to look like, tangent of a plus b again, tangent a plus tangent of b on the top, 1 minus tangent of a times, not plus here, times tangent of b. And then tangent of a minus b, I'll have a minus on the top tan a minus tan b, and then 1 plus tangent of a times tangent of b there. All right? So if we know that one, plug stuff in, I can do that. If I don't want to remember those, again, it's a longer process, but we can always use the sum and difference identities for sine and cosine to go through and find the same things. All right? Those are the identities from here on. We're just going to use them in the same way, same types of examples that we did last time. So for instance, if I want to find the exact value of sine of 75 degrees, I'm looking for an exact value, I need to make sure I'm using those special trig angles that are going to give me the exact values. So I can rewrite sine of 75 degrees as sine of what? I want to use the special trig angles. 45 degrees plus 30 degrees. I only have three of them, and then just multiples in whichever quadrants we're in. So it's 30, 45, and 60, or whatever those equivalent uh, reference angles are in the second and third and fourth quadrants. All right, but sine of 45 degrees plus 30 degrees, use the sum sine identity. So in this case, sine of 45 plus 30 is going to be sine of 45 times cosine of 30, and then plus, same, same sign, plus cosine of 45 times sine of 30. Okay. And I know all those sine of 45 degrees is square root of 2 over 2. Cosine of 30 degrees is square root of 3 over 2. Cosine of 45 is the same as sine of 45 square root of 2 over 2. And then sine of 30, 1 half. So I'm just going to plug those in. Simplify the same way that we were doing before. And I end up with square root of 6 over 4 plus square root of 2 over 4. So square root of 6 plus square root of 2 over 4. Right? Again, any of these are basically going to look like this because if we're using the special trig angles, I'm going to have, these are my only possible outcomes. It could be positive or negative for any of them. But square root of 2 over 2 for anything that is a reference angle of 45 degrees, square root of 3 over 2 for anything that is either a reference angle of 30 or 60, depending on whether it's sine or cosine, and then 1 half in the same way. It's not really a lot of change that can go on. It's going to be a lot of square root of 6s and square root of 2s, either plus or minus or both minus, something like that, over 4 there. All right. The only other way that could change is I have some even nicer angles, the quadrantal angles, like cosine of 90 or sine of 180. That'd be great, because those would just cancel out and be a lot easier. All right? What about tangent of 7 pi over 12? Remember, if I'm going to find the exact value of that, I need to be using the special angles that I know the exact value of. So 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, are equivalent to pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. 
pi over 6 would be 2 pi over 12, pi over 4 would be 3 pi over 12, pi over 3 would be 4 pi over 12. Those are always going to be the same thing. Again, depending on which quadrant we're in, but it's always going to be something like that. Those reference angles will be the same. So in that, if that's the case, 7 pi over 12 could be just 3 pi plus 4 pi over 12. So I'm going to have tangent of 7 pi over 12 is equal to tangent of pi over 3 plus pi over 4. And then plug those in. So the sum identity, I'm going to have tangent of pi over 3 plus tangent of pi over 4 all divided by 1 minus tangent of pi over 3 times tangent of pi over 4. Okay. Tangent of pi over 3 is equal to what? That's a 60 degree angle and it's in the first quadrant. The opposite side would be 60 degree like this. Opposite side is the longer side, so it would be equal to what? Square root of 3, and then the adjacent side would just be 1. So tangent of pi over 3 is just square root of 3. Tangent of pi over 4 is 1, one because it's a 45, 45, 90, so both sides are 1. So I'm just going to plug those in. Actually, I'm not going to use that. I'm not, don't, don't look at this one. square root of 3 plus 1 over 1 minus the square root of 3 times 1. All right, and if we want to simplify from there, again, if we need to rationalize this denominator, since it has a radical expression here, right, it's not just the square root of 3 in the denominator anymore. It's that 1 minus. So in order to make sure there's no radical value still in the denominator, I'm going to have to multiply by the conjugate. Right? I need, I have a minus b, if I multiply by a plus b, I get a squared minus b squared, and that's going to get rid of the square root when I square it. Right? So I multiply both the top and the bottom by 1 plus square root of 3. Right, when I do that on the top, I just have to foil that out. So square root of 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus square root of 3. And then, like I said, on the bottom, difference of squares. So a squared is 1 squared minus b squared, so square root of 3 squared. So that just gives me, on the top, a 4 plus 2 times the square root of 3, and then 1 minus 3, or negative 2. And then if I really want to complete that, since I'm adding these terms on the top over this one single numerical value in the denominator, the only time we can do that. Take 4 divided by negative 2, take 2 square root of 3 divided by negative 2, and get negative 2 minus square root of 3. All right? So that's the simplified form. Again, if we need to rationalize a denominator uh, and because it has a radical in it, uh, and it's not just something simple like this. If it's just square root of 3, multiply the top by square root of 3 and the bottom by the square root of 3. Perfect. But if it's 1 minus or if it were 1 plus, Multiply by the conjugate, change that sign in the middle, go through that process. All right? And that's what the fully simplified version of that would look like. Don't do this. It's not square root of 3 plus 1, that's the square root of 4. That's, that square root should not be over everything. All right? Shouldn't be over everything here. It's the square root of 3 times 1. All right? still should not be over everything here. Just the square root of 3 plus 1 over 1 minus the square root of 3. And then it does the same thing from there. It's right finally on this one. But, all right. All right. So finding those exact values, using the ones, using the special angles that we know to find the exact value, and then also using the sum or difference identities for sine, tangent, cosine, whatever we have. Let's say I want to find the exact value of sine.
sine of 40 degrees, cosine of 160 degrees, minus cosine of 40 degrees, sine of 160 degrees. For this one, I need to recognize that this is going to be what? I'm going to use which identity here? I'm going to use sine. Am I going to use the sum or the difference? The difference, because for sine it matches up. Why sine and not cosine? Because I have a sine of A, cosine of B in the first part, cosine of A, sine of B in the second part. If it was cosine, it would look like what? B. Cosine 40, cosine of 160, minus sine of 40, sine of 160. And that would be actually a sum identity if it was cosine. So recognize the difference between the two. Sine and cosine on either side of the plus or minus means we have a sine sum or difference identity. Right? If I have cosine in both terms in the first part, sine in both terms in the second part, it's the cosine identity. All right? But since we just said it's going to be sine and it's a difference, I'm going to have sine of 40 minus 160. So sine of negative 120 degrees. A few different ways you could look at this and solve it. I mean, I know it is going to be a reference angle 60 degrees somewhere. So negative 120, I could go backwards, be in the third quadrant there. I could also write this instead because it's sine and it's an odd function as negative sine of 120 degrees and work with that. So 120 degrees would be in the second quadrant, reference angle of 60 degrees. What is sine of 120 degrees? It's still second quadrant, it's still positive. The opposite side would be square root of three, hypotenuse is two. So I'm gonna have a negative and then this value would be square root of three over two. Either way, I mean, you can do this. You can just, again, you want to draw it in the third quadrant where it would be and use a reference angle there. I know that sine should be negative in the third quadrant, which is where negative 120 ends up. All right, so however you get to that point, whichever way you want to do it, if you do it this way, if you do it some other way, that's fine. As long as we get the right value and the right uh, positive or negative in front of it. All right. Let's say I want to write each of the following functions as an expression of only functions involving theta. All right? So I don't want to have anything that has, say, cosine of 30 degrees or sine of 30 degrees. I, the only, only trig functions I want should be operating on theta. I want to simplify anything else from there. So if I have cosine of 30 degrees plus theta, this is a cosine sum identity. So what is that going to be equal to? Cosine of A plus B is equal to what? Cosine A, cosine B, minus sine A, sine B. So I'm just going to plug in 30 degrees and theta for A and B there. I get cosine of 30 times cosine of theta minus sine of 30 times sine of theta. And cosine of 30 degrees, what? Square root of 3 over 2, sine of 30, 1 half. Plug those in. And now I have a function just of theta. If you want to, since you know these are both 2s in the denominator, you can combine them together. You don't have to. I mean, this first part's usually fine. I don't really see this as being simpler than this one. But Go ahead and do that. We might be able to see something that we can simplify from there sometimes. All right. If I just plugged in, again, the only thing are functions of theta that I have left, not functions of 30 degrees or anything like that. If I want to write tangent of 45 degrees minus theta in a different way, tangent of 45 minus theta going to be equal to tangent of 45 degrees minus tangent of theta, and then I'll divide it by 1 
plus tangent of 45 times tangent of theta. All right? So plugging in to that identity, same idea. Note for tangent, again, on the top, the sign is the same as what's inside of there, the a minus b or a plus b. It's minus or plus up there. On the bottom, we change the sign. Right? Tangent of 45 degrees is what? One. So one minus tangent theta over one plus one times tangent of theta, so just one plus tangent of theta. Right? And sine of 180 degrees minus theta. I use the sine difference identity for this. What's that going to be equal to? Sine of 180, cosine of theta. Sine of 180, cosine of theta. Minus, minus cosine of 180, cosine of 180, theta. sine of theta. Exactly. All right. Get those right. The sine in between stays the same. And then I can just plug in. Sine of 180 degrees is? Zero. Cosine of 180 degrees is? Negative one. So I get zero minus a negative sine of theta. So just positive sine of theta. All right. Sound good. Technically, if I looked at this, if I wanted to rewrite this, this makes a lot of sense. If I wrote this as sine of negative theta plus 180 degrees, means I'm shifting to the left 180 degrees. So that's halfway, but then that negative means I'm going to flip it. I end up with exactly what I started with. All right. All right. Let's say then another type of example that we kind of went through last time with cosine. <laughs> if I have two angles A and B, standard position where sine of A is 4 fifths, and A is in the second quadrant, it's between pi over 2 and pi. And then I know cosine of B is negative 5 thirteenths. B is in the third quadrant between pi and 3 pi over 2. And I want to find sine of A plus B, tangent of A plus B, and then I want to figure out which quadrant A plus B is going to be in. All right, we don't actually know that. So remember, I only know where A and B are, but I don't know exactly where they are in those quadrants. I could be as, it could be almost exactly equal to pi over two, just barely more than that, and then just barely more than pi. So if I added them together, it would be just barely more than three pi over two, that be in the fourth quadrant, more than three pi over two. But I could also be just barely less than pi, and barely less than three pi over two. If I added those two together, that's five pi over two, which is one time around, and then barely less than pi over two again, that's in the first quadrant. So I can't tell just based off of these two things which quadrant A plus B is gonna be in, all right? We're gonna have to use the values that we get for sine and tangent to figure that one out. I have to figure out where it is. Even if I don't know what A and B are exactly, I can figure it out based on whether sine is positive and tangent is positive, or both are negative, or one's positive, one's negative. We'll go from there, all right? So if I want to find sine of A plus B, I know the identity for that, sine A cosine B, plus cosine A sine B. I'm going to need to have cosine of A, and I'm going to need to have sine of B to be able to plug into those. So I'm going to have to solve for those, and then I can use you know sine of A and cosine of B to figure out tangent of A and tangent of B. Right? So just like we did last time in one of those examples, I need to figure out what the other values are going to be. If I know that sine of A is 4 fifths, and it's in the second quadrant. I can just use the Pythagorean identity to figure this out. Right? As sine squared of A plus cosine squared of A is 1, plug in for sine. So 4 fifths squared plus cosine squared of A is equal to 1. 4 fifths squared would be 16 over 25. 
one would be 25 over 25, so 25 minus 16 is 9 over 25. The cosine squared of A is 9 over 25. If I take the square root of both sides, I get that cosine of A is plus or minus 3 fifths. Since it's cosine and it's in the second quadrant, it is which one? Yeah, it's minus. It's the negative 3 fifths. Make sure we get the right plus or minus value there, depending on which quadrant we're in. Okay. And I can do the same to solve for sine of B. I know cosine of B is negative, I know cosine of B is negative 5 thirteenths. It's in, B is in the third quadrant. So I'm going to solve for sine of B in the same way. All right, I'll take sine squared of B plus cosine squared of B is one. Plug in negative 5 thirteenths for cosine of B. So negative 5 thirteenths squared would be 25 over 169. 1 would be 169 over 169. So 169 minus 25 is 144 over 169. Take the square root of both sides. Plus or minus 12 over 13. Is it going to be positive or negative since it's sine, and remember, we're in the third quadrant this time. Negative. Sine is negative in the third quadrant. So I get negative 12 over 13. Okay. And like I said, now we can use tangent, or we can use the fact that tangent is sine over cosine to figure out the rest of these. Tangent of A is just going to be sine of A over cosine of A. I know sine of A is 4 fifths, cosine of A is negative 3 fifths. Take that, flip and multiply the denominator. I get that tangent of A is negative 4 thirds, which is good because A was in the second quadrant, tangent's negative there. Right? Same idea for tangent of B, sine of B over cosine of B. I'm going to use negative 12 thirteenths over negative 5 thirteenths. Flip, multiply, cancel stuff out. I get a positive 12 over 5. Tangent's positive in the third quadrant. That's good. All right. I'm just going to use those values. So sine of A, cosine of A, sine of B, cosine of B, tangent of A, tangent of B, and plug in to figure out, or plug into our sum formulas, our sum identities, to figure out the value of sine of A plus B and tangent of A plus B. So sine of A plus B, sine A cosine B plus cosine A sine B, just plug in. 4 fifths times negative 5 thirteenths plus negative 3 fifths times negative 12 thirteenths. It's going to be a negative 20 and a positive 36 all over 65, so positive 16 over 65. For tangent, just going to plug those in. Tangent of A plus B tangent of A plus tangent of B over 1 minus tangent of A times tangent of B. Plug those values in. So a negative 4 thirds plus 12 fifths over 1 minus negative 4 thirds times 12 fifths. Right? Now to simplify this, and I would say, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to make sure you get it right in web work, if this was a problem, you could probably technically enter this in. You have to be very careful with a lot of parentheses that are going to go in there obviously. But we don't like to have fractions inside of fractions. I want to avoid that. And if you do plug that into web work, still at least work towards the most simplified answer that we can get. Because this is not going to be an option. If I ask this problem on the test, this is not going to be one of your multiple choice options. It's just not. All right? It's going to be a much simpler form. So you can still go back and check and make sure you're getting the right answer. I need to get a common denominator on the top. So it's going to be 15. Multiply the first one by 5 over 5, the second one by 3 over 3. That's going to give me a negative 20 plus a 36 over 15, so just 16 over 15. And then down here, I have 1 plus 48 over 15. 1 is 15 over 15, so 15 plus 48 is 63 over 15. All right, and then 16 over 15 divided by 63 over 15, take the denominator, flip it and multiply instead of dividing. I get 16 over 63. 
So as I was saying a second ago, if you want to enter this in and see if it's correct on one word, great. You can also, after you do that, re-enter an answer. Go back, try to simplify, enter this answer, and see if it tells you you got it right also, because that's a good way to practice whether or not you're simplifying correctly. Uh, and it's an easy way to do it, and it doesn't cost you anything except some time to make sure that you know how to do it when you absolutely have to do it. All right? Makes sense there. For some reason, even though this is the stuff, you know, to know coming in to this class, that's the stuff that I feel like will see the most mistakes, but that's where it is. All right? Last thing, where is A plus B? The angle A plus B. I know that sine is 16 over 65 is positive. I know that tangent is 16 over 63 is positive. Where are both sine and tangent positive? First quadrant. All right. So I know whatever A plus B is. Again, I don't actually know the value of A or the value of B, what those angles are. But I do know that when I add them up, I end up with an angle in the first quadrant. All right. Makes sense. Questions on that? Yeah. So you have to choose the coordinate where you go. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Since we found this, unfortunately, from here we can't necessarily check that we got it right because I don't necessarily know where a plus b is. So we're assuming. We got the right sign, the positive sign here, and the right positive sign there. And so since I know that sine of a plus b is positive and tangent of a plus b is positive, I need to find the quadrant where both of those are true. And the only place where both of them are positive is going to be the first one. Right? If I had gotten that both of them are negative, it would be where? Yeah, sine and tangent are both negative only in the fourth quadrant because cosine's positive there, but the other two are negative. All right. I couldn't get this based on what we were given, but if sine were positive and tangent were negative, where would it be? It'd be in the second one. That's where sine's positive. And if tangent were positive and sine were negative, third quadrant. So we'll just base it off of the values that we know they have to have. I know a plus b in this case has to be quadrant one, but that's how we'll look at it for that. All right, last thing, verify an identity. So let's say I want to verify that sine of pi over six plus theta plus cosine of pi over three plus theta is equal to cosine of theta. Obviously, I'd be working with the left-hand side of this because there's no way to simplify the right-hand side. I the only thing I can do there is actually make it more complicated. So we'll work with this side, see if I can simplify it down to cosine of theta. I have a sum of angles inside of sine, a sum of angles inside of cosine. So I'm just going to use their identities. So sine of pi over 6 plus theta is going to be sine of pi over 6 cosine of theta and then plus cosine pi over 6 sine of theta. For cosine of pi over 3 plus theta, I'm going to have cosine of pi over 3 times cosine of theta and then minus sine of pi over 3 sine of theta. All right? And then I just want to simplify those values that we know. I know that sine of pi over 6 is going to be equal to what? Sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. Cosine of pi over 6 is? Square root of 3 over 2. Square root of 3 over 2. Cosine of pi over 3 is one half. 1 half. And then sine of pi over 3 is? Square root of 3 over 2. So when I plug those in, I have 1 half cosine theta plus square root of 3 over 2 sine of theta and then plus one half cosine theta minus square root, square root of three over two sine of theta. Well, I'm just gonna combine these like terms, plus square root of three over two sine of theta minus square root of three over two sine of theta, those are just gonna cancel. One half cosine of theta plus one half cosine of theta would be one cosine
cosine of theta. All right, and so that side looks like the right hand side. We verified that identically. Makes sense. Any questions on that? So that covers everything with the cosine sum and difference, sine sum and difference, and tangent sum and difference identities. We remember those. We can use them anytime. Going either direction, remember, I can always use something in terms of an identity. If I see that one side of an identity was tangent of pi, or let's say tangent of x plus tangent of y over one minus tangent x tangent y. I know I could simplify that and rewrite it as tangent of x plus y if I needed to do that. So remember, identities go in both directions. They're equal on either side. Um, that goes for all of them. And we can use that if we need to. Okay. That's it for 5.4.